would fall on the ground and roll around in that tent because they got hit with power in their belly that shifted them from a religious understanding to something supernatural. And it would be so real because it was outside in a tent. My aunties, I called my auntie one day. We were talking. I said, I want to come by the house. And I went by her house and I had a conversation with her and her husband. He was a pastor. And I said to them, uh, I said, hey, you know, you know, tell me about this, that, and the third. And she shared with me a picture of my grandfather's tent. And I began to talk about that. She says, oh, Kevin, I remember that when we was kids, we'd be walking to school. The kids made fun of us. They picked on us. They talked about us. I said, why did they talk about you? She said, because we was having church in the tent. And the kids would throw rocks at the tent and run. You know, because they had no understanding of exactly what that looked like. Mount Pisgah got a building. Mount Sinai got a building. Mount Moriah got a building. Mount Nebo got a building. But we in a tent. <clears throat> And she was showing that to me to let me know exactly the type, of, uh, the type of difficulties you may have suffered as a kid to know that your parent was the one who pitched a tent in the 1950s to have church. I began to think about that thing really tough in my heart to understand what audacity should a man or can a man have to say I'm going to lay it down on the line enough to embarrass myself amongst a community of people who do not know what I'm doing for the sake of the gospel. Similar to Noah, similar to those, God will always commission a man or a woman to do something that nobody has ever seen for the purpose of making his glory be made manifest in a region. And this is why I believe God has led us to this series because he's trying to bring us back to what am I willing to risk for the sake of the gospel being advanced. The real question is, if you're not ready to be ready to be talked about for what you do, then you're not doing anything for the sake of Christ. That if we really want to return back to the first century church with the antiquities of what God had placed upon and anointed those people to believe, please understand that the real church comes with persecution. Y'all like the kind of church where everybody likes you. But I'm realizing that if you hang out where everybody likes you, because sometimes we want to go where everybody knows our name, and they're always glad you came. I get it. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is confrontational. The gospel upsets people. The gospel frustrates certain religious norms. The gospel confronts sin. Y'all quiet up in here. Because that's a cuss word in today's church. Nobody wants to be told that what they're doing is sinful. Grace is not a shield against sin. Grace is empowerment over it. And so I was sitting here thinking, like, Lord, where do you want me to go with this? And I was telling, telling all my preachers, we're talking in meetings, so it's not like I'm making it up now. We're just having meetings. And I said, man, the gospel that I'm hearing preached today is nice gospel. It's the nice, happy Jesus. It's... It's stuff that's not even, I'm not saying Jesus is upset, but I don't know where in the scripture that we can preach about a God who just, just I just love you. I just want you to be great. I want you to live your best life and just, you only YOLO, you only live once. You get to do your own thing and be lit and have a great time in Jesus and just go enjoy life and go to heaven. But my Bible tells me he's returning with a sword. I'm waiting to hear the people that are okay with the understanding that he is coming back with judgment. That is actually happening. Hell is really real. And some folk, unfortunately, will be there because the people of God have not stood in the gap to preach the gospel or pitch him a tent. All right, that's the intro. So here's the thing. The presence of God, it was always the desire of the Father from the beginning to allow man to experience his perpetual presence. It was never God's desire, D, to ban mankind from him. 
My Bible shows me that in the beginning, God built creation, created and established the earth, and then sent a man there to govern it and to, uh, to steward it and to, to manicure it for the purposes of relationship with him and to be his spokesperson, his model, and his represent representation in the earth. But he also designed it for mankind to come in and out of his presence freely. We were built for communion with God and not community with people. Oh, y'all wasn't ready for that. <laughs> the need for the insatiable desire and thirst for people is really a result of being fallen. That initially, God and man was all he wanted. I wanted them, Adam, Eve, to be here forever. It was not the initial purpose of God for mankind to die. Death is a result of sin. If things had went right to the prototype the way it was supposed to be, Adam and Eve would still be here. <laughs> Take a deep breath, y'all. Blow it out. I know it's warm. So the longing for others came after the fall. We were content initially with him all by himself. And God has always desired to dwell with and among his people. And this is revealed in the Old Testament and consummated in the New Covenant. That God has what you call dwelling places. Shout dwelling places. And these dwelling places with God progress throughout time. Can we deal with the progressions for a moment? Let's deal with first things. God dwelt with man before the entrance of sin in Eden's dwelling, before there was a tabernacle. God walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the garden. Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3. And Orthodox Judaism and historicity teaches us that Eden was elevated. That the Eden was, or the, the knowledge of tree of good and evil and the, the tree of life was center stage. But Eden was elevated. Which means in the beginning, man had to walk up to get to Eden. That what separated the garden from everything else was the elevated presence of, the elevated part of the garden was where Eden actually was. Eden translates to his presence, which means mankind knew from day one that in order to be with God, he had to walk up to get him. That there had been a level of elevation of sight and vision and understanding, even posture. He was moving upward to get to God. From day one, it's a pattern of where God is and where we are. From day one, he's showing us that God is to be elevated. And in order to see him, you got to shift your consciousness, your being, your posture, your physical man in a vertical perspective. Egypt was high. Eden was exalted. And Adam had to walk up to get to Eden. God speaks again, dwelling places. The Bible says that he walked and talked with Enoch and Noah and the patriarchs of their time, Genesis chapter 6. But in Genesis chapter 17, God appears to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and angelic visitations and open air visions. So now we know that God was in Eden, and then mankind sinned. He pushed mankind out of the garden. Then God began to visit men through open air visions and began to visit men through visitations and conversations with them. But it, the next place that he dwells is what he calls in the tabernacle of Moses. Exodus chapter 25. This is when God now begins to dwell with Israel. Then God gave further revelation and truth in his dwelling under the kingdom of David in David's tabernacle. And then God does it again in the temple of Solomon. The tension for these dwelling places or visitations is that they were temporary, seasonal, and conditional. What we don't understand is that in after the fall, when God ever showed up, it was because he had a specific reason. It was seasonal. It was conditional. Or it may have been one dimensional to one particular person. But it wasn't a visitation that allowed him to remain. In other words, there were a level of stipulations and laws and rules that must have been fulfilled in order for him to manifest his presence in a previous context. 
So it depended upon man's entire ability to meet every requirement. So the presence of God then at that time was transactional. Then it was transformational. Are oh, y'all here tonight? I know it's hot. Shot this with me. It was transactional. Then transformational. Which means if you do this, I will do this. If you do this, then I will do this. If you sacrifice this, then I will manifest this. It was transitional. Then it was transformational. So mankind from the beginning is banished from the presence of God. God finds a way to show up again without it being, watch this, once at a time. He found a way to say, if you can't be with me, then I will find a way to be with you. It speaks to his longing to be with his creation. That because you messed up the pattern I gave you initially, that you sinned in my presence, then what I'm going to do now is find a way to still allow you to have access that's going to benefit you until I can completely flip this thing. Because what you messed up in an instant took thousands of years to repair. So what, I, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to establish a brand new pattern to allow me to have moments of visitation with you. Y'all ready for this? The first time we see a consistent dwelling situation was in the tabernacle of Moses, which is also known as a tent. As a matter of fact, they call it the tent of meeting. Help me, Jesus. So what happens is in this tent of meeting, God speaks to Moses. He comes down from the mount with instructions. I want you to build me a home. I want you to build me a, one King James translation says sanctuary, but the real root word is a tent. I want you to pitch me a tent because I don't want to keep manifesting myself through bushes. I want to I show you who I am. And I want the people to see the vastness of who their God is. But in this tent, something has to happen. Something must die. And I, and I cannot give everybody access. So I'll anoint and I'll appoint the few that are necessary to be the ones sanctioned to be able to get into this place so that the people can look from afar off to know that I'm still with y'all. And this particular tent was mobile. It was one that was moved by the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. That it wasn't always erected at the same spot. That at the drop of a dime, Israel had to be knowledgeable enough and Moses had to be open enough that God is going to ask him to pick up the elements of this tent and move it at the speed of obedience. Somebody said it was movable. Say it was mobile. And in order for this tent to work, for you to see my presence, not only should something have to die, but blood becomes a requirement for visitation. But under this Mosaic covenant, God revealed truth to his people, the children of Israel, in five chief areas. He has given them now the law, moral law, civil law, and ceremonial law. He's given them the priesthood, and he's given them the Aaronic and Levitical priesthood himself, both of those. He's given them three chief priests, the Passover feast, the Passover, the Pentecost, and the Tabernacles. He has given them all of this for the simple purpose, hear me, for the simple purpose of creating and reestablishing a way to get connected again to mankind. He builds in his tabernacle the holiest of holy place, the most holy place, if you will, the holy place and the outer court. And in each of these apartments, there were particular pieces of furniture. And the holiest of all holies was considered the Ark of the Covenant. In the holy place was the golden altar of incense, the table of shoebread, I don't have time to unpack it, the golden candlestick. The outer court contained the brazen altar and the brazen lavar. It was the holiest of all, of all that was holy, of God's very presence, and where the Shekinah glory would dwell. And that's where God had communicated with man, dwelling in the midst of his children, the people of Israel, just as even now the presence of Christ dwells in the midst of his people, which we call the church. It's at this moment where mankind understands that through, through what I am having to put together, my ceremonial this and ceremonial that, this allows me, being taught by the Father, that all of this is necessary in order to be connected to who God is. That what we messed up in the beginning has had consequences throughout time in order to get God back to the place 
where he can put together a plan to allow us to have relationship and fellowship with him. Now watch this. That's Moses' tabernacle, Moses' tent. Then we move from that tent of dwelling because that one collapsed. So God says, I got to find another way because the Philistines have stolen the Ark of the Covenant. And Israel, through their disobedience, keeps losing. And somebody has stolen the Ark, which is symbolic of his presence. The enemy, the Philistines, have taken away the Ark of the Covenant, which is symbolic of the person of Jesus Christ. It's, it means his presence, the ark. They took the presence. They took, they took. We had Eden. Eden was taken because of us. The Philistines have taken the ark of the covenant. How do I get back? David goes into battle. David brings back the ark of the covenant. And when David brings back the ark of the covenant, David says, I got to build him another tent. This tent was different than Moses' tent. Moses' tent requires sacrifice. David's tent requires sacrifices as well. But because David had a different understanding because he's a cherub. I believe David is a psalmist. He's a priest. He's a prophet. He's a king. But more importantly, he's a strong prophet. He's prophesying Jesus before Jesus manifested in the flesh. He, David is amazing. David says, I got to build this one just like Eden. You see, the difference between Eden and the other is that uh, I'm going to elevate it. I'm going to bring this back to what God had in the beginning. See, maybe the problem with why we lost the other one is because mankind was coming in, etc., etc., etc. I'm going to defy the law. I don't have an Aaronic priest. Aaron, Abahu, Abinadab, none of them are here. Eliezer, they're not here. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to take this thing to the hill. And I want you to park it up there. And on our way up, we're going to sing all kinds of songs. And to satisfy the sacraments or the, or the stipulations of the law, we're going to take six paces. And every six paces, we're going to sacrifice something in order to push that thing back to where it properly belongs. Because we want to make sure that the people know that the presence of God should always be elevated. Now, in Moses' tent, you, you can look to the holiest of holies, and you can see the smoke coming from the chimney area. You can see that God had just sacrificed something. The people are sitting outside around the camp looking like, okay, the smoke, uh, smoke's up, y'all. They blow the shop off, and everybody goes crazy because they knew that their sins had been forgiven for a whole year. They shouting and bucking like, yes, we good. We got the next 12 months to do, to do. you know. They excited. But David's tabernacle. All you had to do was look to the hill. Y'all stick with me. All you had to do. From wherever you was in Israel. Or Jerusalem, should I say. Because remember, Jerusalem's in the valley. So the Bible says there was a man that went down and fell among thieves. It's down in the, it's down in the valley. So the only place you can do in Jerusalem is look up. That's why David said, I look to the hills for which cometh my help, knowing that my help comes from the, the maker of heaven and earth. It was a shift in the understanding. David, as the old preacher say, looks up. Yeah. And so does Israel, Israel. But then something happened. God says, I want you to build me a house. I'm ready for another tent. And I want this tent to have brick and mortar. David says, I want to build it for you, God. He says, you can't. Your hands are too bloody. That's a whole lot right there. Because who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? Y'all, come here, Bible readers, preachers. Except he that hath. So David now it's like, I can't build this. He said, but your son can. <laughs> so Solomon says, hey, man, I got money. I got power. And these people are going to bring me everything they need to bring. They brought so much to tell me, hey, man, yo, yo, we, yo, stop. And the Bible says that he had the flutes. They had the, the horn section. 
They had the brass section. They had been practicing a whole year for one service. We don't even like to practice at all. <laughs> Can you imagine everybody remembering their part for one service? <laughs> Why we have another meeting? They met for one year, D, for one day. One year. And when they get there, the grand opening, the big processional, read Chronicles, big processional, everybody's coming in. We're marching, marching out to Zion. That's beautiful. They get to the church, and the smoke was so thick that theologians had to create a word to make it make sense. They called the word Shekinah because they had no other word in Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic that you can even define it. So they made up a word to make it make sense. And so Solomon and Ray, they're going to the temple. They're like, hold on, we can't go in there. He's in there by himself in this new tent. So then the enemies of Israel said, we got to destroy this tent. This one, we can't, we can't, that's, that's too much power in that house. There's too much glory in that particular one. And then that tent fell, and then things shifted. But then God says, all right, we got to restore Israel. We restore the gates. Nehemiah builds, rebuilds the city. We fight again. The Babylonian empire takes over. And then all of a sudden, there's 400 years of crickets. Nothing is said. Daniel prophesied it, though. Daniel said that there's going to be a time where there won't be nothing to be done, said, nothing. And then all of a sudden, Daniel said, but then there'll be one that'll come, and he'll restore it all back. He prophesied it 439 years, exactly, for the time that the stars twinkled and said a baby was born in a manger. 400 years underneath a tent. was this baby being born who is God with us. John says he dwelt among men. Yeah. Already, Lord Jesus. So this tent <laughs> had healed the sick, raised the dead, quickened deceased bodies. Y'all hear? This tent walked on water and did everything imaginable. But then God says, he dwelt among you so that I can flip the script yet again to make sure I never leave you again. I need this tent to fulfill what the other tents could not fulfill. Jesus was the fulfillment of the tabernacle of Moses. Jesus was the fulfillment of the tent of David. Jesus was the fulfillment of Solomon's temple. But all of those tents are tents that I can experience. But even Jesus had an expiration date where he had to leave in his tent. So then the Bible says that when that tent had dissolved, Jesus told these men, you men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing? Can I translate that, Devon? What are y'all looking up? <laughs> These men are staring up, looking for something. And Jesus said, hey, look here. Because remember, when he appeared, he's not, he's elevated. And they, they looking for him. He said, you men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing? He, he looks for he's not dead, he's risen. He talks to the 12, presents himself to the others, the 70, and he says, I want you to go to this upper room. I said, Lord, why are you showing me this? It was another tent. And when they're sitting in this tent, because of all of the sacrificial things that Moses and them were supposed to do, 
were fulfilled in Jesus. And everything that you would have to do on the David's tent, which was still under the law, was fulfilled in Jesus. A brand new expression was being born under a whole new tent. And nobody knew. 120 people are sitting under this, in this place, this canopy of a building. And as they're sitting under this canopy, the Bible says, y'all read the text, that the sound of a mighty rushing wind filled the room. And tongues, like a cloven tongue, like a fire, set upon each of them. And I said, Lord, what are you showing me? He said, son, the truth of the matter is, when that manifestation happened, I was trying to show you all that I was undoing fully what I had did or what I had to disband you all from in Genesis chapter 3. I was restoring it because I kicked you out then. But in this one, if you allow me, I'll come into your tent to dwell with you. And because the sacrifices had been made and had already been fulfilled through Christ, I have perpetual relationship with God and I can consistently encounter his presence in this tent. That the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon men. Y'all ready? To fulfill what he began in Eden. He said, and I heard the Lord say, tell them, I told you. I wanted to be with you. I still want to be with you. And the reason why we get to become witnesses is not for the casting out of devils. That's small stuff. It's the mere fact that I am walking and living with the presence of God. The same Shekinah that fills Solomon's temple is the same Shekinah that sits in your belly. The same presence that filled Moses' tabernacle is the same presence that fills your belly. And the same glory that set up in the hill where David was is the same presence that sits in you. Here's the question. Do you respect your tent? Because this thing is holy. See, the scripture says, in this flesh dwelleth no good thing, wrong covenant. In this flesh dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead body. That I get to carry. Are y'all here? My grandfather pitched a tent. My aunt told me that the kids used to make fun of them. She said they threw rocks at the tent. They called them names like holy rollers. All that kind of stuff. I wonder what would possess a person to be willing to do something crazy for God. To allow other people to have the visitation of the presence of Jesus under a tent. Who's encountering God through you and your tent? Are people being made better? Or have they been made bitter? Lay your hands on your chest and say, I'm a tent. That's it. That's all I got. (laughs) Paul says something that I want to read to you again. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You know, this thing is so good that God says, With that tent, because it will dissolve just like those did. (laughs) When that tent dissolves, you get a whole new one that does not dissolve. We talk about going from glory to glory. I think we're going from tent to tent. I'm moving from this one. And when this one eats up and dissolves... I'm instantly into the dwelling place. The Bible says in my house are many mansions, many tents, many dwelling places. I'm instantly transformed into something else that can continually house the presence of who God is. 
The Holy Ghost didn't come and ask just for us to speak in tongues. That's just one of the quick signs that we know you got it. Not the only, though. Just one of the quick ones. We can readily tell right away. We don't have time to wait for peace and patience and long-suffering and, and uh, kindness, you know, gentleness. And there are a lot of people that speak in tongues that are not kind anyway. That's another question. Do you really have it? Because, I mean, if you got the Holy Ghost, you still mean. I'm confused. Maybe you just got the ghost. The holy trying to catch up. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't leave. Wait a minute. Don't leave. No, 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 no. I'm trying to get on your holy. Trying to, trying to get on your ghost. He said, for if indeed in this tent, this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we have put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, shout this with me, we groan. Something in you should perpetually be groaning. Something in you should say, I'm not satisfied. With what I have, there's always another part of God. And I'm willing to look foolish if it means apprehending that place with him. I'm done here. I remember when I was a kid, I would see folk, uh, Devontae in church, man, and them saints was the running and falling out, rolling. And we used to have, they had sheets back then too. Just, you know, sheet ministry is not new. And uh, they had sheets. And if they didn't have sheets, use somebody's suit jacket. Boy, and they had that. I mean, somebody probably had a blanket somewhere. <laughs> and back then, folk would shout, and they had to put arm circles around them, you know, hold them, so they wouldn't break through the barrier, <laughs> or hurt hurt nobody, hurt themselves. You, you know why they did tents, Kim? Because um, it was easier to bring people into a space to feel free to do something they ordinarily couldn't do on a regular Sunday. So you couldn't heal on a regular Sunday. Not, the Presbyterians be like, what are you doing? This is crazy. So A.A. Allen and those guys would pitch a tent and say, bring me all the sick. Bring me those who are afflicted with disease. They say afflicted. Bring me those of the sick and the shut in. Bring me all of this. People would come up. And back then, they didn't have mics like we got mics. They had uh, the little skinny mics, the little Dick Clark mics. And then they had this little harness when it got fancy that was connected to you like this. So you walk around. I've been watching tent revivals for years. They hold it like this. They'd be connected to it so their hands could be free. <laughs> This man's been in this hospital bed for six months, and he hadn't been able to move for six months. He's been sick in his bed for six months, and I'm thinking they took him out the hospital and brought him to a tent. This man's been in this hospital six months, and his wife and family say if he's not gonna, if he's not gonna be able to be made whole, he's not gonna live. He's gonna die. The man will be on that, and they walk to the man and put the mic. And say, hey, is this, is this true, man of God? Did the, did the doctors tell you that you're going to die? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. That's what they told me. Well, the devil is a liar. And I'm telling you, do y'all believe God can heal him? Yeah. Do y'all believe God can heal him? Well, Holy Ghost fire, I'm asking you to touch his body right now in the name of Jesus. Move to the next person. And then if you keep watching, it always happens. About six minutes later, he who was laying down in his bed was walking around. Wife going crazy. People spinning around crying. And they'd be like, I, and, and the guys acting, give glory to God. Keep it moving. I think we don't see it no more. Cause we don't grow no more. We don't see it 
Because we don't have the burden for it. What would happen in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that the healer we sing slow songs about, the healer we holler about, did more than heal your headache? What would happen? If we raise our expectation back. My concern is that we're getting away from the true purpose of why we do what we do. He gave us power. And he said in Mark 16, these signs shall follow them, not me. He didn't say those who preach. He didn't even say anything about taking the text. These signs shall follow them that believe. For the next week, I want you to come into agreement with me. I had to set the foundation. I think that's why the enemy even tried to allow stuff to just frustrate everything. Because I'm, I'm actually on this journey, right? where I want to get back to the real purpose of why we do it. I'm kind of bored with cool church and just kind of over it, man. You know, I'm just, I'm just at a point now where I'm, I'm, I was always taught since 1999 that if it frustrates you, you create to solve it. Not just complain, but have a solution. So my heart now is just, Lord, I just, I want to see what I grew up in. And I'm willing to make this tent and testify about people being made whole. Appreciate your Facebook like, but I ain't talking to you. I'm talking to the one that may not like it at all, but with great desperation. They can say, I don't know where I can get made whole, but I got a feeling if I head over there to that tent on 8235 Vicar, something to somebody it's not just the pastor but something can happen in that room well I can experience Jesus with a bunch of people that groan shot that with me Lord give me my groan